Everybody, it's Dr. Ron here. I'm sitting here with my buddy Craig 2.0, we call him. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, um, and Craig has been through some very interesting things in your life, right? Yeah, yes. And, uh, you know, two strokes and a heart attack. Yep. Right? And live to tell about it, but yep. it's really dominating life and uh, really enjoying life um, despite these circumstances. Right. And, uh, and owning up to these circumstances. But the more interesting thing about you, Craig, is that nothing seems to get you down. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. so, uh, and we really want to, I really want to talk about the psychology of what you go through. Sure. So Craig and I first met um, during his first stroke. Yep. Right. And uh, was that 2015? May 2015. May yes. 2015. And he actually did a very beautiful YouTube video for the American Heart Association. Uh, talking about um, experiences at that time and you know I was his physician at the time and we went through some lifestyle programming and behavior modification um, but what's interesting to most people and this is the first thing I want to start off with for you what's interesting for most people is that you know when you tell them that diabetes caused my stroke they didn't know that diabetes can cause strokes right right, right. So, so tell me about that experience well, for me, it's been a really uh, a big experience. A lot of people that I've talked to that are friends, or friends of friends, have thought, oh, a stroke always happens because, um, because I've had a clog in my arteries or something like that, and it's caused this stroke. And um, they don't realize that um, diabetes just by itself and in, in the way that it attacks your body, the way it attacks your blood cells, the way it attacks your brain, if you have diabetes, it can actually cause a disruption of blood flow to your brain and that will cause cause a stroke. Yeah, I think most people don't understand it's strokes not necessarily a plumbing problem, it's an inflammatory problem. Right. So you have blood vessels and most people think that well these blood vessels either close off or clot off, which they do. But the reason behind that is not the plumbing issue, it's the it's the inflammation issue, which means that things can get built up and inflammation can get built up in your vessels and they can close off. And the sugar is the main culprit right in diabetes that can do that now you have things other than sugar that can do that as well um, but there's a very clear association between you know diabetes and, and heart disease and strokes and in fact um, diabetes itself in uh, in you know in doctor terminology we call it the 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 coronary and artery disease equivalent or the cardiovascular disease equivalent meaning that those people who are diabetic we consider them as high as a risk as if they had heart attacks and strokes in doing preventative care right and so there's definitely an association uh, between between uh, you know strokes and heart attacks and um, and diabetes but let's talk about your your uh, your mentality. Um, so let's go through when you were first diagnosed. So what, what was your mentality? How did you feel and how did you overcome how you felt? You know, Dr. Ron, the first thing I felt when, when I was told by the neurologist and then you uh, later on that morning, same morning, that, um, that I had had a stroke uh, the first time, um, I heard the words um, that I had dodged a bullet. And uh, to me, that was just devastating to even hear that I had dodged a bullet. Because um, when I think of a dodging a bullet, I think of a superhero that uh, is in a movie and a bullet comes at him and they just move to the side and dodge the bullet. And this stroke was much more than a bullet. It was an absolute devastation to me as a person thinking, how am I gonna be able to talk like I was supposed to talk before? How was I going to be able to think anymore like I thought before? All these things were just, well, they were just devastating to me. And so I thought about it for a couple of days, and I thought, um, there's two ways I can go with this. I can be woe is me, like I've seen a lot of people in my life, that when something happens to them, it's just, no, poor me, I've got this problem now, and I'm just going to have to live with it. Or I could... Um, decide to take the circumstances that I have, learn from them as, as I'm going along, and make um, a better life for myself. Um, so it's two very distinct cho choices, and there's one is a very positive one, and one is 
one that just um, leads to a lot of a lot of sorrow, a lot of anger, a lot of emotions that are not not really good for you. So I, I chose I chose the second one. I chose that um, I dodged a bullet, but that uh, I believe that um, that I could make things better for my life and learn from these things that had happened to me as I had my stroke. And um, and, uh, and eventually, when I got to a point where I was feeling much better, uh, possibly share it with other people. So, but it's like a daily decision, right? Aren't there some days you just want to give in? Oh, there's, yeah, there's absolutely days um, when, um, when I have bad days where um, things just don't, don't go from the time I put my feet on the floor until um, until I go in there and do breakfast or whatever. It just um, you just feel like nothing you do is going to work right that day, and um, and you just got to power through those things because it's real easy to just have pity parties and just feel bad about everything and say woe is me, and and I do do that every once in a while. I'm not I'm not invincible, but um, you realize that that's going to be just for a minute. That's just a short time, and that you still have so many other positive things that you can do and things you want to do to improve your life. Right, and um, part of going through something like a stroke is that you've always had the ability to do some things, and all of a sudden, when those abilities are taken away, you don't know how to live without those abilities that you took for granted right. before. Right. So um, I think you were talking to me um, about even just going to the bathroom and bowel movements. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, because um, because your brain just works different than it did before you had the stroke, and so your body works different because it doesn't communicate. Um, your brain and your body don't communicate with each other anymore, and so um, it's even as as serious as not knowing when you're going to go to the bathroom because things are happening um, differently than they normally would. So uh, an example of that would be just um, when I was working back at the office um, after I had my second stroke, I would just be sitting there and all of a sudden uncontrollably things would happen to me and I would lose my bowels sitting at my desk. And, and, um, and my secretary had no clue about it, but what I did was I kept extra... Um, wipes and extra clothes in my office in case this happened because it was such an embarrassing thing for me to to go through but it's part of what happens when you have a stroke how you, did you get through something like that and then still develop the resilience saying i'm going to continue going on yeah and you know kick butt at life like how, yeah. how did you get through something like that well I, there's a lot of things i think it really uh, starts very uh, foundationally, it starts from my dad, my mom, my parents. They just really. Um, my dad always taught me if anything, if anything is worth doing, it's worth doing right. And I've used that all my life, uh, even when I was in the military, uh, when I was uh, when I was in an apprenticeship program, learning how to do a trade, um, when I started managing hospitals for a living. If I was worth doing, it was worth doing right. And as a stroke survivor. That became the same mantra for me that if it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. And that means all these things are going to happen to me that I have no clue of what they are yet, but they're going to happen to me. And then I have to address each one of those things and move forward and not look back, uh, move forward. Right. And so, I mean, you didn't have one stroke, you had two. Yeah. What made you, after the second stroke, just say, you know, like, screw it all, <laughs> like, I'm just going to give up? Like, what yeah. made you not go that direction? Well, I, I wanted to. I really did. I wanted to, okay. to just uh, say, man, the second one in six months, uh, what the heck is going on? Um, what's wrong with me as a person? What am I doing wrong? How am I living wrong to have this happen to me? And, I mean, I asked myself questions about that for a long time. Um, I didn't go back to work for almost six months after the second stroke, and I finally went back to work. It was very uh, slow for me, and uh, eventually the organization I was working with said, we just, we're just not going to be able to leave for you to be here anymore. And so, and so I, I resigned, but um, I, I, I really felt like I had a purpose in life now that I had never had before in managing facilities and managing people. 
Um, that was a really great job. I enjoyed doing that, and I thought it was really um, something special for me to do. But now, now that I had two strokes, I felt like um, I had a purpose to help others. When I went to the hospital and had both of my strokes, I had nobody come and talk to me afterwards or during that time. Medical staff came and they talked to me, but they talked to me about medical things. Um, nobody talked to me about how I was feeling. And nobody talked to me about um, what was working, wasn't working, and why it wasn't. Um, and they kept hearing a lot of things, and I kept hearing a lot of things like, well, uh, this is typically what happens in a stroke patient. and. Um, and that wasn't typical for me. So I, I decided that after this second stroke that I wanted to give back to, to the community. Um, and I went to, um, to a couple of stroke support group meetings at a local hospital. And um, I sat in the meetings and listened to the stroke survivors and their caregivers. And my heart really went out to those because Although I had some, I had two strokes. Mine were nothing compared to some of the devastation that other people were going through. So, um, I had the ability to learn from all that and then come back and share that with others, where others could hardly even speak anymore. Right. And now you're full-fledged volunteering. Yeah. Into a new program. Yeah, I, I working with the neurologists, working with the patients. You do an excellent job. Yeah, and uh, and I get a chance to actually, I even get a chance to contribute in uh, a monthly. Uh, uh, stroke support meetings with the medical staff and administration of the hospital where I sit down in meetings and they talk about stroke uh, uh, um, patients and what they're going through and I just just get to be a part of that and uh, it makes me feel uh, like again I'm fulfilling some of the purpose that I really have pointed myself towards where I can help others and um, I think that um, visiting with patients sitting down in the rooms with them and and actually looking them in the eye and telling them um, how they're feeling it just freaks them out sometimes because because yeah, you've been there cuz I've been there right. I've been in that same bed and actually I'll go in and visit with some people and they're they'll actually um, the family will push a stool over by the by the patient's bed and say please sit down and talk to my mom or talk to my dad about those things right and I do think that you know we have to give credit to your daughters oh you know, yeah they um, I mean they called me I remember and wanted to know more about what to do and they were your advocates, just yeah. like you know other family members are their uh, their family's advocates as well. Yeah. And I think it's so important to have that support group. Um, and even if for those people who don't have family, if you do have a group of people who are there for you, then that's great. But I want to talk about something a little bit deeper. A lot of people go through something and they blame themselves, and there's a lot of guilt involved in it. And what they do is they push their closest ones away. Hmm because they feel like they've done something to allow this to happen. And since they've done something to allow this to happen, they don't feel like they deserve the help from the close ones. So they, they tend to push them away. I see this a lot in healthcare. And so um, for those patients that, who have a stroke that you help, like what do you, what do you, how do you talk to them about what their interaction is with their family member, with their doctors, and everything like that, and how do you convince them that they deserve the love and the help and to accept it? Yeah, it's those are very true feelings of a stroke uh, survivor. Um, ones of, of, a, of a stroke survivor being just absolutely um, angry at themselves for allowing it to happen, and then for putting their family through this misery of having to care for them now as a patient instead of just as a mom or dad or another loved one that had a normal life two days ago and now their life is completely turned around yeah. and and these caregivers they're trying to figure out how they're going to be able to take care of their loved one and still have a job and do other things they have to do yeah, so and hard. so as, as i sit down with them i understand all those things and so we talk about those. We bring them up in our meetings, in my meetings with them, because they're not going to bring it up. The stroke patient's not going to bring it up in front of their family, and the family doesn't understand the dynamics of all that yet. They under, understand something has to change. But I bring up the subject and say, so what do you think you should do about it? I don't give them answers, but I make them, I, I actually, I actually um, give them the process to think about, because it's not an overnight 
uh, fix, it's going to take a while for them to understand how they're going to be able to take care of whoever their loved one is. And the, and the, and the patient is still just trying to understand their feelings and, and why things aren't working like they used to work and how they can't, why can't they talk to their family like they used to do. I think uh, in, in some of the uh, cases where people are just really shut down, this family member may be the actual person who's taking care of all the other family members. Now they need to be taken care of. Yeah. And they lose their identity as a caregiver for the yeah. family. And now they have to be taken care of. And that causes a major amount of depression. Yeah. And, and how do you advise them to work something like so, that? So that's another anxiety, a really big anxiety of the patient uh, because they feel like they have failed everybody. Yeah, yeah. And, and because they had that kind of a dynamic where they were yeah. in charge of everything in the family and all of a sudden they're the patient laying in the bed, right. they feel like that they've absolutely let everybody down. And, and the first thing I do when I walk into a room to visit a patient, I look at their for lack of a better word, their countenance, what they're looking like as they look at me. If they're sitting in the bed and they're sitting up in the bed, or if they're laying flat on the bed, I look at them and I develop a number in my mind and a number between one and a hundred. And that number for me means, where are you right now in your recovery? Maybe post two days after your strokes or one day after your stroke, where are you? And what that means to me is since I've had experience with that, it means that I can give them hope of where they are. And a lot of the patients I'll look at you and I said, you're at 80% back, according to Craig, you're at 80% back because you're sitting in that bed with the bed raised up, you're looking at me, you're talking to me, you're answering questions that I have. And a lot of stroke patients that I visit with are flat on their back and have no ability to communicate. So when I give them a score of like 75 or 80, their faces just simply light up because they realize okay, I'm already on my way back. Yeah, they started giving some themselves credit yeah. for something that they should give themselves the credit in the first in place. In the first place, right, right, yeah. And there's family members are sitting right there listening to this whole thing going, wow, so Craig, who's had two strokes, is looking at my mom or my dad and saying, from his perspective, you're 80% back, which to me means only 20% left. That means there's hope. And there's a way that we can get to that point where mom or dad gets to leave the hospital, go home and start rehabbing and learn to live with a stroke and, and still have a very, very fulfilling life. So not only do you talk to them, you provide them with tools of resilience, you talk to them and, and also celebrate the fact that, hey, you're you know a certain percentage of the way here, you've gone 80% better, mm -hmm. allowing them, recognizing them, attaching their uh, attaching all that they've been through to a credibility platform, we call it, right? Yeah, right. And then it brings them into a reality, okay. And may, they may be able to realize that, hey, I'm making this worse than it really is, right? Yeah, right. And so, and that's really the psychology of healing. Right. You know, the psychology of healing of all, all diseases, not just strokes and heart attacks, but, you know, there's dementia and cancer and all these different things as well. And the formula for the psychology of healing is all very similar. And, you know, your patients are very, very fortunate to have someone like you because well, it really didn't exist before. Right, it didn't, no. Right. Um, I, you know, I had a, a patient not too long ago that uh, when I go into some patient rooms, they don't speak any English. Mm -hmm. They speak a foreign language. And so, um, and so I, I'm prepared for it. I have a person I work with that uh, actually instructs me and helps me on, on what I need to know before I go in the room. And uh, when I go into a room like that, in this case, the, the, the people were, were from, uh, from a foreign country and they only spoke Spanish. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I knew that ahead of time. And um, when you go into a situation where a person has just had a stroke, it's so, um, it's so solemn and it's so sad in some cases, but my job is to try and lift them up. That's part of my job. And so when I walk into a room like that, I, I told there was, four, there was four family members in the room and they, were, they all spoke English. The father didn't and he had a stroke. And I said, I can only speak a little bit of Spanish. And they just looked at me and I said, I can say, yo quiero Taco Bell, <laughs> which is my, the length of my Spanish. And everybody was laughing. Even the dad that had just had the stroke yeah. was laughing because he understood what I was saying. <laughs> And I connected right then yeah. with that group. And I said, 
I want to share with you about my story and I'll be more than happy to let you translate it. And so I sat there by his bedside and his four children sat on the other side. And as I st spoke to him about my story and about hope and about his future, they all took their turn explaining to their dad what they were hearing from me. Oh, wow, yeah. So it wasn't just one kid talking for everybody. Each kid stopped and said something. So a, a 10 minute or 15 minute interview that I would generally do with a patient took me 45 minutes to do. But at the end of it, they were asking me these questions and this is what's really important for me. It really is, what can we do to help our dad? Yeah. And these are four kids that just want to take care of their dad and provide for him because he's done that all their lives. So he was the caregiver. Yeah. And now the kids, the kids turn. Yeah. And um, and also let the dad know that it's okay to get help right. from your kids. It's right. not necessarily a bad thing. Right. And that you know sometimes the we go through our lives and our love language are different from the people that are around us. Mm -hmm. Some people's love language may be touch or words of encouragement or gifts. And uh, and. Because sometimes we speak different languages of love, um, I think for someone who's going through a stroke, it's really important to um, l let them know, hey, what is your language of love? Right. How do you, what, what do you do to appreciate the people around you? And, and how can I show you, me as a family member, that I am showing you appreciation so that I don't, I don't uh, in, uh, unintentionally put a level of guilt on you because you've been you've been my take caregiver all my life right I think some of those people don't even know um, have never even had to do that to think about that whole process and dynamic of being something different than they were before yeah. and so the stroke process the whole process of this makes them actually have to think about it and come up with oh this is what I can do this is how I can help my family and my father and and my 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 children my uh, um, uh, the other kids in our family, I, this is how I can help. And each kid may have a different purpose in that whole process. Yeah, great. So, uh, you know, we'll fast forward a few years and you just recently had a heart attack. Yes, I did. And so, you know, I want to tell you Craig's story is that Craig, I mean, what, 60 pounds you've lost? Yeah. Lost about 60 pounds, was diabetic, no longer diabetic, reverses diabetes, um, e eating well, um, exercising, doing all the right things, but still, Craig had a heart attack not right. too long ago. Right. And um, and it's interesting because when my team first learned of your heart attack, everyone was surprised. Be like, well, you know, Craig, he's like the picture of health, <laughs> right? Yeah. How did he have a heart attack? And my explanation was that heart attack was going to happen, mm. but guess what? It didn't kill him. No. And not only did it not kill you, I already knew in my heart that you already built up so much resilience in the last few years after mm -hmm. your second stroke and, and counseling the patients that I remember talking to you on the phone after learning about your heart attack and I think I told you I am not afraid. Yeah. <laughs> right is what I yeah. said. And I have full confidence yeah. that you have the resilience to get through it. It's just another challenge to get through. What I heard from you yeah. also in that same phone call was yeah. this is just a blip. Yeah, I did say this that. This is just a blip in your life yeah. and things will move forward. Yeah. And it did. Yeah, it did. It did. Yeah. And um, and um, the biggest thing that helped me through a through the uh, uh, heart attack was I was now listening to my body instead of just ignoring things. Mm -hmm. After having had two strokes, I understood exactly the dynamics of a stroke and what it causes you. But the heart attack, I knew from being working at a hospital and working with a stroke and a, and a cardiac caregiver, I knew all the symptoms of that. Actually, I even make the folders for all the cardiac patients. Oh, so when I was in the hospital yeah. in the IMUs, they brought me a red folder, and I said, "You know what? I can tell you everything in that because I make it for you guys That's every day." Funny. And so uh, they kind of looked at me, kind of, kind of. And Katie, my daughter, that was with with me. She said, "Dad, please leave me alone," you know, because she thought I was just aggravating everybody. But, um, but uh, I was more informed than before, um, before the strokes, and I was able to from that. Uh, listen to my body and stop walking and sit down and relax for a little bit and then realize when I started walking again it was starting up again so then I went directly to the hospital 
and uh, they found out very quickly that it was a, a mild str mild uh, heart attack and that was uh, that's because I went in the doctor told me if I would have continued walking I probably would have dropped dead in the mall so yeah, well, you uh, you live to tell the story yeah I live to tell the story yes right there's uh, there's so many events that happen to people and people perceiving it as this happened to me rather than I'm a person I just happen to have this yeah um, and I call it disease identification this happens a lot with people with cancer like mm. of, you know I am the cancer you're, you're not the cancer you're a person right you just exactly. happen to have cancer right. you are Craig and you happen to have two heart attacks and a stroke or well, two strokes and a heart sorry, attack sorry two strokes <laughs> and a heart attack so the more important lesson here is that these things happen in your life, but it, you grew stronger exponentially mm -hmm. every time, and you make the people around you and the people who experience these grow stronger as well. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's, um, um, and I think it's all, in it, in it may be kind of uh, um, a thing that most people say, but it's because you ha I have a positive attitude. Yeah. I really believe that, that my attitude makes all the difference in the world. I'm, I'm um, almost uh, two months post uh, um, heart attack and um, I'm not back to the normal hours I was working as a volunteer before and that probably won't happen for a while, but I'm contributing and I'm working three or four hours where I used to work six hours a day and so um, I'm still helping out and I'm ab still able to see patients that are, have had strokes and um, and I enjoy what I'm doing, and and that's the biggest thing is, um, as a former stroke patient and a heart attack patient, is you got to enjoy life. And if, a former diabetes patient. Yeah, and a former diabetes <laughs> patient too. Yeah, yeah. You, you kicked butt and all. Oh yeah. All oh, well, you know. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, and it's um. Yeah. And it's uh, and it's not not easy to do too. I I gotta confess that. And in the video that I share with the National uh, Stroke Association. Um, I was asked about that and I told him it was hard work. I even repeated it twice because it was hard work uh, to change all those things in my life and to maintain them and to make sure that they stayed that way because um, once you've had those things happen in your life and you felt how it changes your life, you never want to be there again.